Hello again. I know a lot of musicians who have problems with the 20th century and if you have problems with Wagner and Debussy, I don't think I can help you. But if you're all right with those two, then I can recommend three composers who can really get you into the 20th century. These are Bartok, Hindemith and Messiaen. Start with whichever one you, you, appeals to you most. And uh, you don't have to work on all three, but if you can get through all three, they really will open the door to other people. Let's have a look at Bartok first. Uh, he was born in 1881, so he was actually 58 when the Second World War broke out. He then moved to, uh, moved to America, and by that time he'd already published these piano pieces, which are a tremendous introduction to all the music of the 20th century. These are, it starts, this is the first of them, it's like any other piano primer. Starts very, very simply. Now this is the first book of Microcosmos, it's the first piece in that book. Uh, and the pieces are ordered progressively, so that by the time you get to the end of the fifth book, you're already playing something like this. Unlike his contemporaries, Bartok never made a, uh, an intellectual description of his compositions. A lot of people have done so since, and we certainly can agree that the main sources will be the um, of course, the, the, the standard tradition, the symphonic tradition, although, uh, of course, Bartok reacted very much against the German tradition. Um, he collected folk songs, he took a lot of music from folk song, and the Slavonic and Magyar elements in these folk songs account for so much of the other uh, aspects that are not easily visible in the uh, Wagner Debussy tradition. You'll find curious parallels to the uh, music of Mongolia, the folklore of Mongolia. And um, of course, if we know anything about Genghis Khan, we'll probably know that there might be a connection there somewhere. Anyway, at the end of Microcosmos, we're already playing pieces like this. <laughs> at the outbreak of the Second World War. Uh, he'd already fallen foul of the Nazis and his music had de been declared decadent and he'd moved to England. One of the big advantages in his music for us and today now is of course this wonderful theoretical work of his, the, um, the Craft of Musical Composition is the English version of this and um, he gives really a blow-by-blow -blow account of how he goes about composing music. There is his analysis of Bach, Wagner, Stravinsky and Schoenberg, which are invaluable, and um, his basic theory of trying to create a musical language subsequent to the standard tonality, which had been more or less exploded or pushed to its limits by Wagner and contemporaries. Um, the Schoenberg is, of course, somebody who is very much going against this, but I want to talk about Schoenberg in the next talk. With Hindemith, you can probably find his, slight, his music is slightly more approachable. Um, here's an example taken from his Ludus Tonalis, which is a sort of an answer to Bach's 48, if you like. Um, there are fugues, all three parts, and even the introductions seldom go beyond three parts. And um, here's an interludium from this series. The third person on my list is Olivier Messiaen, who, like Hindemith, 
wrote a very good introduction to his musical language. This is called Technique de mon langage musical and is available in English as well. Uh, this uh, gives a thorough description of the various techniques that he's been using up till that time, which it was written in 1944. Uh, at the beginning of the war, Messiaen was 31. He spent the first year, actually, some months of the first year, in a prisoner of war camp, uh, which is where he composed, finished composing, this famous quartet for the end of time. But coming back to his musical language, uh, three elements that are very obvious and very much char very characteristic. First is bird song. This is written down as uh, a blackbird. Messiaen spent a lot of time just out in the garden um, with, his, with his notebook and just writing down the sounds of the songs of the birds, obviously compromising them into our 12 notes because, of course, birds are very seldom obliging enough to sing in exactly the type of pitches that we have. But rhythmically, extremely accurate, and even with pitch, just they certainly give a very clear impression of the birds concerned. Another characteristic of Messiaen's style is the slight addition, or the addition of very tiny rhythmical elements. Now this would be difficult enough for most of us to understand just as a body line. But then, given these little changes in the rhythm, making it totally irregular, makes it very difficult for my ear just to organise this, because my ear loves fours and eights and twos and things that it can just organise easily. And this is very irregular. Now there's one chord which will help us understanding some of Bartok's music, which is the so-called alpha chord. It's a combination of two diminished sevenths and if I put those the other way around we get Now this chord may first of all hit you as a terrible dissonance, but as I say, if you can get, actually, if you can make friends with this, you'll discover that Messiaen is also using it in a different way, because the thing that Messiaen is most certainly famous for um, are his uh, modes of limited transposition, as he calls them. The first of these is just the whole tone scale, but the second is actually a transposition of this chord again, now, if I put that an octave lower, and then, like we did with Silent Night, we just play the notes one after another to get a scale. Going up the octave then to the C, where we have a semitone, a whole tone, a semitone, a whole tone, a semitone, a whole tone, a semitone, and a whole tone, and this is the second mode of limited transposition. The third mode that Messiaen uses is a, like a combination of chords that Debussy was very fond of. If Debussy would sometimes give us this, a seventh chord on C major, for example, then followed by a seventh chord on E major. But well, if I take that up one third more, the seventh chord on A flat or G sharp, remembering that all semitones on the piano are the same, D sharp and E flat are the same note, well I get these notes again, and then if I go up again, well I'm, I'm back to C, so I just go up in thirds, in major thirds, with dominant seventh chords. That gives me a scale, if I like, of one tone, two semitones, one tone, 
two semitones, one tone, two semitones, and I'm back to C again. And this is Messiaen's third mode of limited transposition. If you play around with these modes, doing as we did when we were playing around just with jingle bells, that we put it into all sorts of different scales, and so, just to see what comes out, you'll be amazed at some of the strange new sounds that come out of this. Now, I'm not saying that anybody has to do this, because it's very important that you, if you want to compose music, should be writing music that means something to you, not just trying to please some examiner somewhere. But if any of these composers appeals to you, I can really recommend hunting around uh, on the internet for a performance of Bartok's Concerto for Orchestra. With Hindemith, I recommend the Symphonische Metamorphosen and Matis de Mahler, and with Messi and the Quartet for the End of Time. All these pieces date from around the war time as well. And um, once you've made contact with Bartok, you'll find it'll open the door for Janacek, Stravinsky, Prokofiev and Shostakovich. The music of Hindemith might open the door for uh, Schoenberg, Henze and possibly Britain. And Messian to Varez and two of his, possibly his most distinguished pupils, uh, Boulez and Stockhausen. That's all for today.